This is a talk about Reactive. All the Reactive content, apart from this presentation, is tomorrow. So I'm going to give everybody kind of a really quick intro to the motivation for Reactive. Why should you care? We're not going to talk about performance or any of those kind of like technical low-level issues of the Reactive. I'm going to talk a lot more about kind of the spiritual, the conceptual, the kind of real reasons why you're going to see long-term value from going Reactive. The talk's in two halves. I'm going to talk a little bit about why I like Reactive and what attracts me to it. And then I, I built something for work. And I'm going to talk you through it. Um, full warning, Stefan is outside now changing the APIs. So it's, it's out of date already, but you'll get the picture. Um, previously, I was co-founder of Spring Source, and I've brought my little Rod Johnson bobblehead along, in case you haven't got one of these. You can win one if you take a lot of photographs with speakers today. Um, and now I'm doing machine learning at Skipjack. We use machine learning to do performance optimization of applications. And we like Reactive for two reasons. We like to build things with Reactive. It helps us build microservices in a way we think. It helps us think about how our systems and our microservices piece themselves together. But also, it's nice for performance. You, know, it's, you can build performance systems with it, and you can build tunable systems with Reactive. You can get me on Twitter. Um, I'm on GitLab and GitHub. The code for this talk is on my GitLab at HotspotMon, and I occasionally write a little bit about maths and modeling and performance. So as I said, I want to talk about principles. I want to talk about why. Like what, what, what does Reactive mean? Why should you care? What are the key things you're going to have to learn? What are the key things you're going to gain? And then we'll see some code for as, kind of as long as we've got. This was originally a 50 to 60 minute presentation, uh, and that's the slot I pitched to Peter, and then he gave me 30 minutes. So we're just going to see how it goes. It's going to be, it's going to be exciting. But let's start at the beginning. Why Reactive? And the thing that attracts me the most to Reactive is that when you think about systems and when you think about really high quality kind of architectural components and things that compose, things you can reason about, good architecture is fractal. The way you talk about your systems and how systems communicate is very similar to the way you should talk about how your subsystems in those systems communicate and how your classes and how your objects and how your modules communicate. The whole thing is fractal. Um, I'm a little bit of a kind of conceptual architectural geek slash snob. Um, so this really appeals to me. It's the kind of thing you can model mathematically. It's the kind of thing you can think about. But Reactive is probably the first time I've seen this translated well into code. In my mind, it can, you can trace this back to the 70s when Tony Hall came out with CSP, and you could reason about systems with CSP. You could reason about subsystems with CSP. You could reason about classes with CSP. Now you can build systems that way. You can kind of construct whole systems and whole services and piece them together using similar concepts. This is where we get reactive systems. We start to think about everything using the same terms, everything using the same abstractions and the same concepts, and how we see objects being pieced together and composed. We also see services being pieced together and composed. Did anybody go to Mark's talk about Spring Dataflow before? Um, there's a few of you. He was talking about composing microservices together as streams. And Reactive talks about how we might compose objects inside microservices together as streams. And obviously, we can do the same thing for whole systems as well. It's not just microservices. So this notion of a stream and this notion of kind of reactive components that we can piece together, that we can transform, is something where you start to see this fractal, fractal nature arise from. So this wasn't working before, but we'll, we'll give it a go. OK, cool. Um, you can see here, like, this is my hotspot mon. So I had a problem, which was I wanted to monitor the internal state of all the JVMs on a machine across a whole fleet of machines. In particular, I was interested in finding out the state of the JIT compiler. This is not something you can access via JMX. There are no standard APIs for this. You have to kind of get into the internals. And Hotspot exposes uh, an API called JVMstat, which is kind of for internal usage. There's a whole bunch of Sun tools and on our Oracle tools that use this API to give you kind of serviceability and so forth. It's a very useful API. But it's horrendous to code to. It's like the worst API. You'll see some examples when we look at how it was wrapped in Reactive. And what I was interested in was modeling this notion that 
I had a series of JVMs, and let's think of those as the publishers of data. They're the kind of the sources of data. And I wanted Hotspot Mon to consume all that data and then push it out to various different sources. In my case, Influx, because I'm monitoring this time series data, but maybe also into Elk for kind of searching and so forth. And the idea here is that in real time, I'm watching the JIT compiler in systems, figuring out when the system is warm, and that's kind of ready when we're ready to test. And all from the top to the bottom, you can think about this as being a stream of data, a stream propagating from the publishers to the hotspot mom, which is the subscriber, but is also a publisher down to systems downstream. So that's kind of systems as, a, as reactive. You're thinking about how a whole system might look reactive. But inside that system, inside that hotspot mon, there's a whole bunch of extra components in there. If you think about it, we need to figure out how to monitor the JVMs. There's a whole bunch of timing issues about when, when do we sample, what do we sample when, how do we keep the, kind of the state of things that we're monitoring up to date. When somebody expresses an interest in a new metric on a new JVM, how do we see that? And we can monitor, and we can kind of model all this as streams, model all this as reactive streams. So thinking from the top again, I've got my JVMs in the outside world, and I've got a little reactive component or subsystem that, tr that translates JVM start into reactive. And I'm consuming that data in my sampler, but I'm also consuming a clock signal. And I can model my clock as a reactive stream as well, and we're going to see some examples of that. And I'm pushing this data out to Influx, but also to my repository, and then kind of down onto the web. And uh, Jürgen talked about this before, and I guess it's been hinted at maybe in some of the keynotes as well, that Spring 5 is going kind of natively reactive. You're going to be building reactive web components. You're going to be using sort of end-to-end, -end, right from your repository, all the way out to the web. It's going to be this stream of data that you can transform and compose. So it helps to think about how you might break your services down into their subsystems. I think it's naive to assume that a microservice is going to be the lowest kind of building block. It, you don't want to end up where every microservice is like two classes. They're just so fine-grained that the Maven POM is more code than the Java code. That's kind of taking it to the you know, areas of craziness. So each microservices will have subsystems. It will have kind of individual parts of it that could be used independently, but aren't necessarily packaged independently. But good architectural practices and good design, coupled with Reactive, will allow you to kind of ma maintain these discrete areas of function. But it's not just the subsystems themselves that are reactive. We can even think about objects and classes as being reactive. So if you think about this in the hotspot mon example, I have a JVM, so like one object representing every JVM. And then for everything that I'm sampling, for every metric that I'm sampling, there is a stream of data for that metric coming from that JVM. So maybe I'm interested in knowing you know, the total number of compiles. And at first, it's maybe 62, then 83, then 100. And the subscriber is consuming that data. And I've got hundreds of these metrics. There's like 250 available to me. And I'm watching them all. But these are individual objects that are also streams, composed into subsystems that are also streams, composed into services that are also streams, composed into systems that are also streams. So it's just fractal. The whole architecture is just streams and composition on streams. It's very powerful. It's not just thinking like sampling's a, <laughs> sampling's a really simple problem. It's really the kind of canonical problem that translates into reactive, in my opinion. It's like logging was for AOP back in the day. When everyone used to do an AOP example, it was log the entry and exit for a method or do tra transaction demarcation. Metric sampling is kind of reactive logging, um, but there are so many more things you can model as reactive. So here's one that's interesting is we're monitoring a system and JVMs come and go. You know, application components start, we want to test them, they go away, more JVMs start. So we can kind of treat that stream of JVMs arriving as a reactive stream as well. In fact, when we look in the code, we can do the, op the opposite. We can treat JVMs dying as a stream as well. Like When a JVM terminates, we get a signal emitted on a stream to say that JVM's gone. You can pretty much model everything as these streams. And when you start to model everything as streams and you look at the, the kind of wealth of operators, which right now is being extended by Stefan out there in the hallway, it makes sense because you can compose them in all these very powerful ways. Now, that's all well and good. 
it's kind of a bit hand wavy. There's this kind of architectural purity here, and I can sit here all day and talk to you about self similarity and fractals and so forth, which is very interesting. But when you see it in action, you kind of see how it, how it, how it pans out, and it, it helps to understand why this works. So, what are the principles in the reactive world, in the reactive kind of mindset that make this work? The reactive manifesto talks about four things it talks about resilience, it talks about responsiveness elasticity and kind of asynchronicity or message driven components. And you'll see different people have different stances. If you talk to the guys from Lightbend, which was previously TypeSafe, and they're the ACA Scala guys, they'll tell you that microservices should be message driven always, and they should be asynchronous first, and that any kind of synchronous processing is kind of anathema to them. And that's, that's a valid viewpoint. Um, I think it's maybe a little bit too religious on one side, like sometimes asynchronicity is great, but also sometimes a synchronous call is all you need, especially if you've got some kind of low volume service where you're not performance critical, maybe you're not even production critical, going to the overhead of introducing asynchronicity maybe is too much. Likewise, resilience. Um, it's become the mantra that you must always build resilient services now, like, like you, everything must be resilient, but it fundamentally treats every service as the same. Like, if you were Google and you were building the, the Borg clustering system, the bit that actually does like, you know, all the workload placement, I would say that's far more important to be resilient than the bit that does the thumbnailing for Google um, Hangout pictures and so forth. Like, if that breaks, no one really cares. So not every system is created equal. But Reactive provides us with a way to, to make things resilient or get some resilience for free. What's most interesting, I think, and this is the reason why I'm really excited to see it all coming into spring, is the responsiveness piece is, the, is probably the most important part. Certainly from my business, we're in the business of performance optimization. We have a lot of customers who care a lot about responsiveness. Uh, when we started our business, we had this thesis that everyone would want to save money by making their applications run faster and then having fewer instances running in Amazon. But actually, most customers want to run faster just to run faster, just to make their system more responsive for their customers. So being able to build applications that are more responsive just straight out of the box is really important. And key to that is being able to build concurrent applications very safely. And that is a big enabling part of Reactive. So for resilience, who's heard of back pressure? Very few of you, and that's, that's not surprising. So the idea of back pressure is to break the common problem in systems that are asynchronous, which is the publisher's publishing things and the consumer's consuming things, but nothing links them. Nothing tells the publisher how much data the consumer wants, or worse, nothing tells the publisher how much consume, data the consumer can even handle. So back pressure is a principled way in which the consumer can control how much data is coming from the producer can signal, you know, please stop. And the idea here is that you don't run out of memory, that you don't all of a sudden start thrashing because you've just, you know, constantly GC is, is pressuring you. You're not just completely swamped with data. You want a really nice way of saying, I'm ready for more data now. Please stop. I'm ready. Please stop. I'm ready. Please stop. And you can kind of see this here. Like, I've got this total compiles stream. So this is a stream of data about the JIT. And I can sample this as quickly as I want. So I could sample this every two milliseconds. And when you're hitting a system hard with a lot of load, the JIT compiler is basically working as fast as it can, so it will change on a regular basis. And we're trying to publish this downstream to Influx, and eventually it's going to HTTP. So there's some you know, very um, fast component where we're just doing like sampling of memory. So the way these counters work is they're just a memory mapped file. So reading from it is very quick. Whereas publishing over HTTP to a, a time series database, possibly on another network somewhere, that's a lot slower. So naturally, there will be some kind of back pressure here. And if I were to do this naively and just do the usual kind of synchronous call and keep hammering that HTTP client, I'd either just start to block and go back, and at some point, the queues would, would, map, would, would kind of build up and it would die. Or I'd do the very traditional Java asynchronous thing of have a, a blocking queue and put those things in a blocking queue and have some publisher that's pulling off them, but the rate of publish will be way faster than the rate of consume, and that queue will just grow and grow and grow and grow and grow and then pff, explode. So the nature of reactive systems is to have 
bounded queues everywhere and have back pressure from the consumer to the publisher. So I request, I'm ready for two more items, please. I'm going to publish them. And when I publish them, I'll get two more items, and so on and so on. Coupled with this is responsiveness. And this is, you know, it kind of goes hand in hand. This idea that I'm going to hand off to a queue to continue processing downstream. And all these things are happening asynchronously. So the, the publisher can keep publishing to the queue, and the subscriber can keep reading from the queue independently of each other. They're running on different threads or on different thread pools. And one of the nice things about Reactive, and certainly Project Reactor, is that it makes the scheduling of tasks on different thread pools and the handover nice at the API level, but also very explicit in the construction. When you construct your streams and you construct the wiring of your streams, you're very explicit about what thread pool you subscribe on and what thread pool you publish on, what the queue size is between those things, and how the back pressure works. You have full control over that. And it's in that sense that the idea is that all of the streams and all of the APIs are message driven. You're handing over to a queue, and you're expecting to be resumed at some point in the future. And this is basically apparent in the APIs, and, we'll, and we're going to look at that now. So you're going to probably hear tomorrow quite a lot about reactive streams, which is the pivotal project for reactive. But there's also RxJava which is another reactive Java project. There's also Rx.net, Rx.ruby, Rx.js. There's like tons and tons of projects that have these same concepts in there. That in itself is quite powerful. If you can imagine on the server side using Java, you can model with these reactive streams concepts. You can publish that data over the web using reactive streams, again, with Spring 5. And then on the client side, you can use Rx.java. You can completely reify that data into a reactive stream on the JavaScript side and you can basically carry on from there with the same concepts. So it really does extend kind of from end to end in your stack. In an effort to standardize this in the Java world, the community, so Project Reactor, RxJava, the Akka guys, have created reactive streams, a set of very simple standardized APIs that kind of capture the essence of what reactive is. We start with a publisher, and the idea is that a publisher will um, publish data to a, to a subscriber. And the only method you get on here is subscribe. So every time somebody wants to subscribe to your publisher, they pass in a subscriber, and away you go. You start publishing to them. No return value. And none of these methods have a return value. And the idea here is that you're always expecting kind of continuation later on. And there's a whole host of APIs about what thread the subscribe happens on, what thread do any publications of data happen on. You have complete control of all of that. On the other side of that is the subscriber. So the subscriber is the way of now actually getting the data. And to preempt any questions for afterwards, people might ask, well, what about completable future? What about you know, deferred result? All these kind of things. The really important part of why this is such a powerful API is that it pulls out all the most important callbacks. So you get a start callback on subscribe. You get an on next callback. So for every piece of data you get, you'll get called on next. Where all asynchronous processing APIs I've ever seen tend to go wrong is they conflate the last two, on error and on complete. On complete is success. It's done. It's fine. I'm thank you. You can carry on. On error is it's gone wrong. You need these API. You need these APIs. You need all these callbacks, and you need to handle them all appropriately. You might need to close whole hosts of resources if there's an error. Maybe you're holding open some kind of connections to an external system, or you're monitoring JVMs that you want to kill if the monitoring uh, dies, you need to obviously propagate all these errors back up the channel. And there's a host of operators you can use to do this. You can manage your errors as nice as you can manage your success data, another nice part of the reactive API. There's this notion of a subscription. So if we go back, actually, and see here, when we get called with unsubscribe, we get past the subscription. Uh, holding on to that's really important. Because by default, you will not receive any data until you call request. And you're gonna, this is how back pressure works. The initial, set, the initial setup with back pressure is you're, you're applying infinite back pressure. You have no demand. And until you request some data, you'll get no data. And it's up to you to call request, process some data in on next, and then kind of do it again and do it again and do it again. Now, there's a whole host of kind of convenience features in the API that you can use that avoid the need to do this. But the essence is there by default your subscriber will not get data until you ask for it. And it's down to you to cancel. 
It's down to you to say, please stop now. And if you can think about it, 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 you know, it may well be that a lot of stuff's happening behind the scenes. Like in the case of Hotspot Mon, when someone subscribes to a metric, I start a clock signal and I'm, you know, I'm sampling that every 50 milliseconds or whatever. If you cancel that and I don't, you don't tell me, that clock's still running, still sampling that value every 50 milliseconds. It might not go anywhere, but that code is still running. So the ability to cancel is really important. Now, this is the fourth and final interface in the Reactive Streams API. And I'll admit, when I first saw it, I was a bit, what is the point? Um, OK, so it's something that's both a publisher and a subscriber. Surely that's very common. And in fact, it's so common that it's really important. You might be better calling this an operator. So when you're piecing these streams together, what you're often doing is kind of chaining a series of operator on, operators on streams. And you're subscribing, you're doing some transformation, and you're publishing the transformed data, and you chain these together. And actually, when you're calling these operators in a long chain, what you're doing is just chaining these processes together. So this ends up being probably the most important abstraction, because it's the one that gives you all the power. It's where all the compositional power comes from. So you can think about reactive streams as defining the kind of the programming model. And then Project Reactor and RxJava and other things define an implementation of the model. And in Project Reactor, we have two classes, Flux and Mono. Now, these names are crazy. They don't mean anything. Except I'm pretty confident that Mono is a disease, and so is Flux. So um, I'm not sure where the names come from, but that's what I always think of when I see them. But it's really simple. Mono is just 0 or 1. You'll get one thing or nothing from that publisher. And flux is zero to many. You may get nothing, but you may also get an unbound number of values from that. And then Reactor will manage all the back pressure and all the asynchronous processing. You don't have to worry about queue bounding, threading, kind of handoff, anything like that. All of that sits inside the project Reactor. And somebody at the end of Jurgen's talk asked me a question, where does the Reactor or the disruptor or the ring buffer, which many of you may have heard kind of used alongside this project, sit in this world. It's an implementation detail. Don't worry about it. It's just a really efficient way of doing that handoff. If, if you now have this kind of constant handing off between publisher on one thread and subscriber on another thread, and you're piecing these together, it becomes very important that that happens quickly. Uh, otherwise, this is a, a model that's no longer performing. And a lot of work has gone into this. Um, Martin Thompson of LMAX fame reliably tells me that the fastest this can possibly happen is five nanoseconds. Um, so now, obviously, everyone's striving to make sure that we can get Java handoff between one thread and another as close to five nanoseconds as possible. But that sounds ridiculous. But if you look at the numbers they've got for traditional Java blocking queue, it's very slow compared to disruptor and ring buffer. So it's an implementation detail. You don't worry about it but it's an important implementation detail. So now in practice, let's take a look at the code. So this is what I built. Um, and I, as I said before, the point of this is to kind of get internal hotspot metrics and push them out to the outside world kind of on demand. We want to be able to do two things. I want to be able to start a JVM with a particular command line and then pass that command line and use it to say what metrics to sample. I also want to be able to connect to a running JVM and at runtime tweak what it is that I'm sampling about that JVM. So Hotspotmon has a web API where you can post and kind of query the existing statements of interest, and it also has a way to monitor JVMs as they come up and start sampling them immediately. And I'm going to look into this in idea. And what I wanted to do with this, not only was solve the problem, but I really wanted to try and push to the limits this idea of using streams to capture all the abstractions, because I thought, if I do that, if I can capture all the main abstractions, when it comes time to compose them all together, it will all work really smoothly. And it did. And that's why I was so excited to give this talk. So the first thing we built was this clock. And the idea is you're sampling a metric every 50 milliseconds. And you want something that emits the time at every period. So I've got a flux of long. I don't have a, a flux of long every 50 milliseconds or whatever. And just a little kind of hack here. There's a protected method that takes a supplier of long. So if you want to change what the time value is, you can do that. Um, and one of the things that I put in the, 
the, the abstract for this talk was that testing is really, is really easy with Reactive. It's really powerful. And there's a really nice kind of testing DSL. So we can see this here. I've got a dummy value of one, two, three, and I'm going to create a, a tick publisher that will just emit that value every tick. It's not going to emit the new time. It's just going to emit one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. It's going to do that every 50 milliseconds. And then using the test subscriber class from Project Reactor, I can subscribe to that publisher, and then I can await. And for every one of the arguments in that await, it will basically wait for the next value and then verify it. And all it's doing here is saying, expect at least three values, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. But then I wanted to check that actually, when I'm really using system current time millis, that it is actually working and I'm getting the right thing. So I can pass in an assertion here rather than an actual value. And this assertion is just a function that takes the value in and then you return a, a Boolean. Um, and I'm just saying that when you see the value, you're obviously seeing it later than the current time. Early, sorry, it's from earlier than the current time, so just assert that. There was no other meaningful assertion I could make there. But it's Project React that's handling the threading here. It's waiting for those three values. And if after some timeout period, I think it's three seconds by default, you haven't received those three values, then it will fail the test and say, sorry, this isn't working. So you've got a really easy way to sort of block and pull all that asynchronicity down and just block in your test. Because you, J, J unit, yeah, isn't reactive. So there's no way to say to J unit, this is going to happen at some point in the future. You kind of have to block. I'm also interested in figuring out when JVMs arrive. And as we talked, you saw in the slides before, that kind of steady stream of JVMs arriving, there was a stream of that. This is what the flux of VMs is modeling. And then each VM has a set of interesting monos and fluxes. So it's got a mono of integer for termination. So when that VM terminates, it emits its PID. Um, the reason for this is that the JVM stat API just simply doesn't really work for termination. If you're monitoring a remote VM, you'll sometimes get a termination event. If you're monitoring a local VM, you never get a termination event. The VM can go away, and you happily sit there reading the last value of all the sample values again and again and again until you restart your computer. So we had to build that, and we had to extract that behind a, a mono. Likewise, I wanted to be able to find out all the available metrics, so I've got a flux of that. But the most important one is being able to sample. I want to sample this metric name, at this interval with this time unit. And what I get out of that is a tuple, a stream of tuples, two tuples. The first value is the timestamp, and then the second is the actual value that it's sampled. And this will just continue to be emitted until I cancel it. And we can see some details in the implementation of this. The most kind of, I think, important thing to see is this. This is how you bridge between kind of traditional asynchronous publishing APIs think things like AWT, Action Listener, or any kind of API where you pass in a listener and you get called back. You want to bridge that into Reactive, so you can do it this way. You can create a flux using this callback, and it gives you this emitter. Then using that emitter, you can emit events whenever you see them. So inside here, I'm creating a JVM stat listener, and the details of this API are not so important other than to recognize it's kind of messy. And every time JVM start calls me, I emit events on that emitter. So that's how I'm handling on next. That's doing my on next, on next, on next, on next. If I see some errors, then I'm going to call emit a fail. And that's how I'm propagating the on, on error call we saw back on the subscriber before. So if for some reason I can't actually add my listener, I'm going to fail. And then the most important thing is to make sure I clean up after myself. So the emitter has a callback. It has something that will happen when the subscriber cancels. And here, all I'm doing is just removing the listener from the host. If you don't do that, obviously, you can create hundreds and hundreds of these streams, and you cancel. But all the listeners from before are still left behind. So eventually, you just kind of run out of memory, and pff, it explodes. So it's really important that you clean up after yourself. That's branching kind of into the outside world. What's also really nice is thinking about how to sort of piece these things together. So. I'm going to just sort of do this. This is one of the nicest things that I, I liked. Um, I wanted to have the ability to sample, but obviously when the JVM terminates, I want to stop that stream. If I didn't stop that stream, it would just kind of keep emitting values, even though the JVM had disappeared. 
So I start with a publisher that's ticking at the sample interval, and I map that onto a tuple of the actual value. So you kind of see I'm piecing these operators together. And then I do this take until, and I'm passing in that mono that before. And this will basically carry on until that mono emits a value. And the moment it emits a value, that flux will terminate as well. So we're able to propagate the VM termination signal back to all the sample streams as well. Really, really simple. So in one place, we have logic for how termination is, encap is, is encapsulated and how, it's, and how it's tested. But we're able to reuse that everywhere else. So that's really quite simple. I can't see my own. This I want to do just to show something. This is watching new JVMs come in and, and admitting statements of interest. There's a kind of particular command line string you can apply, and it tells you what metrics to sample. But here you can create fluxes from Java 8 streams. So although the operators look kind of the same, like filter and map, those are operators on a Java 8 stream. And that stream itself is completely adapted into a flux. So if you've got an API that's already emitting Java 8 streams and you want to just adapt it, it's very easy to do so. Just kind of create the from stream. Where the flux is so much better than the stream, though, is you have this ability to peak. And this is a nice little design point here is I can peak on every next, and I can call my logger. So I'm, these are rare events, like statements of interest may be changed like five or six times during the life of one of these monitoring events. So doing an info log here is really important to make sure that we saw that statement of interest. I don't have to write another subscriber to subscribe to that, that stream. I can literally just kind of tap into it, peek on what's happening, and just do this kind of imperative action. The functional purist in me hates this, but I think it's kind of really useful. Um, and then kind of right at the back end, and this is probably the most important kind of impressive code, when we start to think about piecing this together and sending it out to Influx, the time series database, this is when we really start to see like how all of the uh, operators can stack up. So the sampler is basically pulling together all of the samples. So you saw that we, we had one method to sample metric and another method to sample metric and so on. The sampler will basically create one stream that has all those samples interleaved. It's really, really nice. But here what I want to do is now send these out to Influx. So the first thing I do is kind of turn it into a, an Influx point, which is the domain object that Influx DB has. Then I buffer them. And I'm basically doing a batch size here of, say, 100 or every three seconds, which is really nice. So in Reactor handles all that for me. It either gives me 100 or it waits three seconds and gives me, say, 50 or whatever. So I'm kind of getting these batches to push out. Then I'm turning that into a batch, and I'm saying what to do with back pressure here. This is where I get slow. Like Publishing can be quite slow, and these batches can arrive really quickly. These are just sample data, so losing them isn't important. I don't want to stop. I want to kind of carry on, but I'm happy to drop them. So I just say, on back pressure, drop. And if I've got warning enabled, I'll get a, a warning in my log to say I'm dropping some batches. I'm also tracing sometimes when I want to see publication. And then I'm just controlling where publish and subscribe happens. So I'm using a specific scheduler to publish out to Influx. So I've got like one thread, basically, that just handles the publication out to Influx. So Influx is a great time series database, but it can't handle a huge influx of data at the moment. It's still quite new. So you can't publish like hundreds of thousands of values. So we use that thread to limit how much data we're sending to it. And then just kind of because of, uh, of interest, I created my own subscriber here with all of the things done completely. So in onsubscribe, I store the subscription and kind of request the first batch. And then in on next, I write each batch out and request another one. And if I didn't put this here, then I'd publish one batch and stop. And if I didn't push this here, I'd never publish anything, because I'm never, never expressing demand. Um, so lots of the, the subscribers you see and lots of the um, kind of APIs handle this for you by expressing kind of infinite demand. So you can pass in the standard Java consumer from the Java 8 API, and you get infinite demand, and you get called back. But when you need more fine game control, you can implement subscriber yourself. And all this code's available on, um, on GitLab, and if I had my full session time, I would have gone into more detail, but Peter screwed me. Um, it's kind of his fault. That's what we'll say. Um, so I just want to summarize. 
Think about reactive, more importantly, as a way to think about problems. It's this fractal, this fractal model. You can apply the concepts and the ideas all the way down from the top of your system right down to how your individual objects collaborate. Publishers are your outputs from things. They outputs from systems, your outputs from objects. And subscribers are your consumers. Really powerful isolation. You get async, isolation, and capacity management is just completely built in. Queue management's built in, threading's built in, back pressure's built in. This is just all something you get for free in the model. You've got reactive streams to kind of serve as your interchange API. Um, for those of you who are worried about portability, I will say in practice, it doesn't make a lot of sense right now. React is where all the action is, so don't worry too much. As you saw in my code, I was coupling myself to Flux and Mono in most cases. That's kind of fine. If you don't do that, what you tend to find yourself doing is you expose a publisher, and the first thing you do is you turn it into a Flux to do something meaningful with it, because all the operators exist on Flux and not on publisher. And because of this, you know, it's, it's Project React. That's where all the sophisticated implementation is. And I think... Uh, it's five minutes over, sorry Steve, um, but time for questions if you want some, otherwise thank you very much.